guys ready to get in the Word? Y'all excited to get going? Our first series of the fall 2021 tonight, if you're taking notes, go ahead and go to the top of your first page and write down these three words. Own, love, live. Everybody say it with me. Say own, own. Love, love, live. And tonight we're talking about a one step and a three step process of what it looks like to be a true believer and a true follower of Jesus. Now, I'm going to date myself here and tell you how old I am. Does anybody know what this is? All right, so I see the parents lighting up in the back. All right, this is a store that used to exist called Blockbuster. Has anybody here ever been inside a Blockbuster? All right, cool. So mostly it's all parents and me. That's great. Here's the deal. On Friday nights, when y'all went to football games and y'all go do your thing, I went to Blockbuster, okay? Friday nights were lit. Because you got to walk in Blockbuster and it's just a store full of movies and DVDs. Games, you could go pick out whatever you wanted. Listen, man, I tell you, I still stand by it. I am 205 pounds today because of the eating habits I established from Blockbuster. I promise you, the best popcorn, the best candy selection, and the best movie selection ever, because here's the deal. Hulu and Netflix used to never exist. Most of you are like, what? My sixth graders are like, what? Yeah, Netflix used to never be a thing. When I was in elementary school, going into middle school, Blockbuster was the hit. Now here's what made Blockbuster so cool. You could walk in, you could know what movie you're gonna go rent for the fifth time and watch the movie for the hundredth time, and you're still gonna love it. You could choose any movie you wanted, as many as you wanted, just kidding, you could only choose three, but still, whatever. I took, I took four, I'm telling on myself. But Blockbuster was awesome, because it gave me so many options. I got so excited, I'd go in and I would look and I'd be like, man, this movie or this movie, and I would like read the description and I would look at the picture and I'd be like, I want this one, okay, this is great. I'll take it up, here's how this worked. You would take up the case, hand it to the worker, they would hand you back the case and you left. It was awesome. Three days later, you gotta bring it back. If you don't bring it back, it's 250 a day, late fee. I probably had $100 in late fees. Anyway, sorry mom, uh, that happens. But Blockbuster was awesome. It gave me choices. It gave me the ability to decide what I wanted to watch. And honestly, I, I want to give you the negative side to Blockbuster is that it gave me the ability to have multiple options. It gave me the ability to choose a movie based off of what I saw on the outside and what I read about it, but I had to actually take it home and watch it to see if I liked it. And see, tonight I want to talk about this idea of own it because a lot of us, I believe, in our Christian walks in life are simply just renting our faith from other people. A lot of us that are believers in Jesus, maybe babies in the faith, or maybe you've been a Christian for a while, a lot of us treat it like Blockbuster. We'll go find a friend or a family member that's living for Jesus and we'll just be like, hey, I'm gonna hang around you for a little bit and kind of absorb some of what you're doing into my life, but I'm never gonna make a choice myself. Or maybe you got that group of friends on your football team or your softball team and they're all Christians and you're like, all right, I'm not living my life right, but they are. I'm just gonna hang out with them for a little bit and fit the mold. And before long, what, what I'm afraid happens is so many of us that say we have a relationship with Jesus are only renting and borrowing our faith from people who really do because we really don't. I'm afraid that the generation that is coming up through the ranks of our student ministry and in the world right now, in your culture, so many people love to talk a big talk, but they never follow the footsteps that they're supposed to. Many of you in the room have friends that say they're Christians, but are they really? And maybe, just maybe tonight, that's you. Maybe you walk in here on Wednesday nights and you absorb what we do and you hang out and you love it and it's fun, but it's like you're in a blockbuster every week. You're looking at this friend and this friend and that person and this person and like, man, I'm just gonna go like hang out with them for a couple weeks and then I'm gonna do my own thing then I'm gonna find somebody else. And see, tonight I want to break the habit with this because with our faith life, the most important thing you can ever do, the most important decision you can ever make the greatest thing you can ever do for yourself 
It's not pick the right college. It's not make a 36 on your ACT. Not to have 10,000 followers on your Instagram or 100,000 views on TikTok. It's to have a personal relationship with Jesus because nothing else in this world matters. As I was praying through how we're gonna start fall 2021 coming off of summer camp, coming out of summer and off of a great spring semester, I, I thought there's no better way than to take it back to the basic and to talk about a relationship with Jesus. If you got your actual Bibles tonight, remember, no phones. If you got your actual Bibles, we're gonna be in the book of Ephesians chapter two. If you don't, no sweat, it'll be up behind me. But tonight, we're gonna be looking at a passage of scripture from the apostle Paul. Everybody say Paul. And Paul was a man of faith, but he was also a person who persecuted Christians before he met Jesus. Paul literally killed believers because he hated them. He was a Pharisee because he believed in the law, and the law of Moses was the only thing that you could believe in. You had to base your life around it. You had to live your life around it. And he was so ingrained in the law of, of Moses that that's all he focused on. And Jesus was just this guy speaking a bunch of just random mumbo-jumbo. And Paul was on his way to go arrest and kill some Christians, and God showed up to him. In the book of Acts, you can read it in Acts chapter 9. Saul was his name, and he's walking down the road, and God meets him where he's at, changes his life, and from that point on, he becomes one of the most influential people in the entire book of the Bible. He writes most of the New Testament. He writes letters to churches. He gets thrown in prison multiple times, all for preaching the gospel to those who didn't know the gospel. He went from just someone to actually a somebody because of the person he believed in was Jesus. His life was forever changed because he owned his faith. And I'm, I'm afraid, I, I truly am, before we get into this, I, I'm so afraid, hear me when I say this in love, that so many of us that are in this room right now are so good at saying, man, I'm a Christian. Man, I'm a believer. I love Jesus, but our hearts are so far from him. Tonight, I want us to get it right. I want us to own it and to really ask ourselves, where are we in our relationships with Jesus? Where are we in our faith life? How does it look? Are my feet matching what I'm saying or am I just talking a big talk? Because if we're not careful, if we're not careful, our lips will be polished and our hearts will be tarnished because we have spoken more than we've truly believed. We pick up in Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10, the apostle Paul writes and he says this, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, a group of believers, and he says, once you were dead of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers and the unseen world. So he references Satan here saying that before we met Jesus, we used to live underneath his authority, that every decision we made, everything we did was not underneath the blood of Jesus because we did not have any salvation. Is everybody tracking so far? Nod your heads if you're with me. Great. Verse three, he said, all of us used to live that way, following the desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everybody else. So here he breaks it out even further. By the things we chose to do and the decisions we choose to make, we're all sinners. Everybody say sin. It's all of us. We were born into sin. There's nothing that you did to make that happen. It's how life is. From Genesis 3 all the way to now in 2021, we see a pattern of sin that God's people disobey him and do stupid stuff, but he still loves us and forgives us. But it takes a choice. We pick back up verse 4. He says, but God. Everybody say, but God. Everybody say, but God. Is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sin, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And he puts in parentheses, it is only by God's grace that you've been saved. Verse six, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us 
in all future ages as examples of the wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Jesus. And God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this because it is a gift from God. And we end in verse 9 and 10. He says, salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done so nobody can boast about it for we are God's masterpiece and he has created us new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he prepared for us long ago. Ephesians 2 Paul writes to the church and he says, here is who you were. Here is who God says you are. And here's what your life should look like now. If you're taking notes, truth one of two tonight is simply this. True faith is not borrowed or rented faith. I'll say it again. True faith is not borrowed or rented faith. Your friend's relationship with Jesus can never be yours. Your mom and dad's relationship and faith can never be yours. Your pastor, your coach, maybe your uncle, maybe your brother and your sister, your grandma and your grandpa, the people around you, something that's kind of piercing to us is that their faith can never be our faith because they've made a decision to follow Jesus and maybe we haven't. True faith is not borrowed or rented because true faith is a personal relationship. Faith can't be bought. You cannot throw a $100 bill down and say, Jesus, there it is. I'm good, let's rock. You can't say, okay, hey, Aaron, Here's 20 bucks. Let's pray so I can just have a little bit of Jesus. People do that. I'd recommend not doing that. You can't say, okay, Jason, you're a believer in Jesus. That means I am too. It doesn't work that way. And a lot of us, if we're not careful, we try to do that. Like I said earlier, we find our circles, we find our friends. It's like we're going to Blockbuster and looking for that movie through all those titles to find the one friend that loves Jesus because we want to fit in with them because we're afraid that we have to make a decision that's going to change our life and we have to give up control. I'm here to tell you something just personal. That was me. I was 15 years old in the middle of one of the worst seasons of my life. I had lost my grandfather to cancer. I had been to eight different funerals of my family members, and my uncle had just passed away, all from cancer. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was in counseling. I was failing school. I had no friends. I was a loner. I just kind of was doing my own thing. Didn't go to church. Didn't do anything like that. I, I didn't have this growing up. And I had one friend, she goes by the name of mom. She said, look, we're going through hell right now. But my friend has been going to this thing called Celebrate Recovery, why don't you go with me? And I was like, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'll pass. And lo and behold, six weeks later, had I known this, my mom had been praying for me for six weeks straight to just try church out. She bugged me and pestered me. Now, gotta, gotta tell you this, me and my mom are more best friends. Mama, if you're watching, I love you. I love my mama. I'm a mommy's boy, 100%. Any mama boys in here? Come on, it's okay to admit it. I love my mama. Cool, that's good. We're all on the same page. There's no judgment. But me and my mom were best friends. Growing up for me, it was my, me and my mom. That, that's how it always has been. That's how it was, and that's how it still is. And I can tell you that I would jump at the drop of a hat for her. I'd do anything in the world for her. I love her. But something that I would never do was go to church because she asked me to because I was too afraid that I would burn the church down when I walked through the doors. I was afraid of being judged by a group of people. I didn't have this relationship with Jesus. I didn't really know what it looked like to believe in Jesus. All I knew was Christians go to church. They're different. They're weird. They follow this book of rules. I didn't want any part of that. I was playing baseball. I was trying to do my thing, playing video games. Shout out to Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Let's go. I was a stud at it, okay? But the one thing I was missing was Jesus. 
and six weeks of praying and six weeks of my mom truly asking God to change my life, I got an invitation to go to a pig roast. Anybody ever been to a pig roast before? If you've never been, they take a 100-pound hog, bury it in the ground, smoke it, smolder it, pull it up, and you eat it. It's amazing. Amazing. And I met a pastor there named David, and David introduced himself to me and said, hey, I'm David, and I'm the pastor of this church. I'm glad you're here. And I was like, man, that felt good to hear for the first time in a long time. But what I didn't realize I had done is that I had pretty much taken my faith that I had as a kid and put it over here because of everything that happened in my life to get me to where I'm at. And maybe some of you tonight, that's you. Maybe something traumatic has happened in your life and Jesus used to be a priority and now he's just an accessory. Maybe Jesus used to be the thing that you love to do and go to church and learn about, but maybe now he's just a cross you wear on your necklace and you don't really care. And I'll never forget, I walked into church the next Sunday, fast forward into my story, three weeks later, I accepted Christ for the first time for real in my life and here I stand today, 12 years later, doing what I'm doing and I could never have imagined my life any different all because I made a decision to follow Jesus for real. And tonight, maybe that's some of you. Maybe some of you walk in these doors every Wednesday night looking for that next person to borrow your faith from. Maybe you borrow it from your parents and your brothers and your sisters. Maybe it's your friends. I want to tell you this truth. Write this down. No one can get saved for you. No one can get saved for you. Only you can get saved for yourself. And I'm afraid a lot of us, so many of us, are contributing to the factor of the way the church is right now, that it's just full of people who are just Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Bible-believing Christians, and Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it doesn't matter. Some of you in here go to Christian schools. Some of you in here go your home school. Some of you have the accessibility to have FCA at your school and you don't go because it's an accessory and you don't truly own your faith. And I want you to understand that you are the only person that can give your heart access to Jesus. No one else can do it for you. Because if you look back in Ephesians 2, Paul says a lot of these words He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin. And then he says, all of us used to live that way by our nature. You see how you see those words he uses to describe the group he's talking to, but he also points to the individual. Because the gospel is a personal message for all of us. And we all have to deal with our sin at some point. Is that you were dead because of your sin. Not because of your mom or your dad's or your brother's or your sister's, but your own sin. And true faith can't be rented because truth too tonight, I want you to see the other part of this, is that your association with church doesn't determine your salvation. Your association with church does not determine if you're saved or not. Just because you come in these doors on Wednesday night doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you show up to church on Sunday morning doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you go to FCA once a week at school doesn't mean you're a Christian. And I think in our culture, we've got it twisted that when you show up to something, you're a part of that. But really, when you show up to something, you're just associated with it. For me, it's kind of where my life was. When I first got saved... Though I had made a decision to follow Jesus, I had been going to church for three or four weeks, and I was like, is that all it takes is just going to church? Until someone said, no, it's a decision you've got to make for yourself. And so for us, I want you to see that just because you're a good person and make good choices doesn't mean that you're saved. Just because you don't cuss doesn't mean you're saved. Just because your mom and dad go to church and you do too does not mean you're saved. And guys, I'm I'm saying this because I love you. Salvation is not based off of association. 
It's based off of transformation that you have to make a decision to follow Jesus with your heart because you can go on every summer camp trip. You can go on every mission trip. You can come to every Wednesday night, life group, theme night, bonfire, one weekend, all you want to. That's great. We're glad you're here. But if you've never encountered Jesus before in a real way, we want to introduce you to him. Because there's nothing greater for me as a person and a fellow believer to see than someone else following Jesus for real. It's not maybe some of you are relating with what I'm saying. Maybe you have determined that you're saved because of the way that you attend church. Maybe you made a decision back when you were six years old. That's great. That's salvation. But maybe some of you did it just because you felt forced to do it. Maybe some of you have the wool pulled over everybody's eyes and you're talking this big talk and you're speaking all these words but your feet are doing this and your mouth is doing this. And tonight I want us to get it right and own it because Jesus says in John 14, 6, he said to the disciples, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through me. You have to have a relationship with Jesus to get to heaven. There's no other way. And because of your sin and because of the decisions you've made, there is no way you can make it other than through Jesus. Paul says it right here. The gospel is this, is that we were literally at war with God. That's the paraphrase for this scripture, that we and in our sin were at war with him. But because of God's mercy and the fact that he loved us enough to send Jesus, we now have access to him through Jesus. But only you can make that decision. And I feel a little bit of heaviness in the room tonight. Because when the gospel is presented, it, it, it confronts us with two choices. We can sit there and try to ignore it as much as we can. Or we can actually own it and say, here's where I'm at. Let's do something about it. And I don't know any better way to kick off fall 2021 than to talk about the gospel because it matters that much. I can tell you this, there's a story of a 13-year-old boy in my hometown, left church, was in a car wreck, and died on impact. Prom night in Anderson County, four teenagers in a car wreck, two dead. Every day it happens. People slip into eternity all the time. And someday it's going to be us. And if we're not ready, if we don't have Jesus, if we're not saved, if we don't know him for real, not just because I'm telling you, but because God's pushing on your heart, you need a relationship with me. I'm sorry, but we're not going to make it. Church doesn't save you. Student ministry doesn't save you. I can't save you. But what can is the gospel. And what can is Jesus' death for you. And tonight, as Josh comes back up, I want you just to bow your heads for a moment. I don't want any distractions. I don't want anybody thinking of anything. I want you to focus in on your heart right now. Maybe where you are. If I was to ask you the question, do you know if you're saved or not, what would your first answer be? If I was to say, hey, if you were to pass away tonight, and I pray to God that doesn't happen, where would you spend eternity? What would your answer be? If I was to ask you, hey, are you one of the ones that's talking a big talk and you're not walking it out, what would your answer be? Because I want you to hear that salvation is not based off of anything you did to save yourself because you can't. You're too weak. Sin is too much for us. But it's based off of everything that Jesus has done for you because he chose to take the cross for you and for me. The Bible says it this way, that we are all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, meaning the decisions we make outside of Jesus lead to the grave. But the gift of God is eternal life forever. Romans 5.8, 
But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still screwed up, messed up people, Jesus died for you and for me. And in Romans 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus truly did raise from the grave, then you will be saved. It's an easy decision. It's not complicated. The gospel is so simple, a child can understand it. And maybe tonight, just maybe, something's pricked up in your heart that, hey, I need to make sure I got this right. Maybe you've got questions and doubts. Hey, welcome to the club. I do too. Maybe you're sitting here saying, I made a decision, but I don't know if it was real. We're glad you're here. Because tonight, Jesus has the power to save. He has the power to heal and restore He conquered the grave. And he loves you. And tonight, maybe if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to do something. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. Everybody's heads and eyes are still bowed and closed. But maybe that's you. And if it is, you're the one with questions. You're the one with doubts. Maybe you don't know if you are. Maybe you're not. Would you just look up at me? And I want you to keep looking at me. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Tonight, the reason why you looked up at me is because it did something in you. The gospel's powerful. It changes lives. And if you're looking at me right now, if, if, if you're making eye contact with me right now, I'm going to ask you to just do one thing, just a very simple thing. No one's looking. Nobody's going to look. I'm just going to ask you, if you would, would you just make your way to the back? And there's going to be some leaders back there. My wife will be back there. Some of our parents are back there. And would you just go and just talk to someone? Now, don't wait. Get up and move where you are. And as they're moving, I ask that everyone respects this moment and you would keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed because that means that all of you that aren't looking up at me have it right. That means that all of you are good, and that's great. But let me ask this, are you truly living the life that we're called to live by being a representative of Jesus? Do we truly own the fact that we have a relationship with Jesus or are we just saying that we have a relationship with Jesus? And tonight, if that's you, if you're saying, man, I just talk it and I don't walk it, man. I just speak it, but I don't live it. Man, I wear this cross around my neck. I've got the Bible verse in my Instagram bio, but I don't live it. Would you just look up at me and be honest with yourself right now? Thank you for looking at me and being honest. Because I can tell you that the gospel is powerful. It transforms lives. It changes eternities. But what it also does is it transforms our hearts and our minds to focus and follow in on Jesus. And tonight, I don't know any better way to start off fall 2021 than this, but to be on our knees praying for God to use us and to forgive us for taking advantage of coming to church and taking advantage of having our quote-unquote quiet time and posting that scripture, would we be vulnerable enough to come to the front and pray, to make our seat an altar and pray and ask God to forgive us and use us? Because the question still remains is, are you renting your faith from other people or do you truly own it and live it?